And so I've done this presentation at Wallingford and Manchester. I've done it in Cunningsville. And I'm really glad to be here in, Wall in Clarendon, where I'm from, and where my great-great-grandfather was from, too. Um, and if there's any people here who have any I, like stories, or if you hear something, please start talking, because I don't want to be the only one here talking. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about my grandfather. I'm going to talk a little bit about bridges in general, you know, the importance of these covered bridges. Um, and I'm not an engineer, so if there's engineers that have something to say, go right ahead. Um, but this was a, a diagram I drew. Can anyone, does anyone know what this might be? Any ideas that anyone want to shout out? Squindles. Squindles? I'll give you a, a, a hint. Oh, there it is in the top left corner. That's a hint, a little hint. Tributaries to a river? That's right. So this is our area. So this is the Otter Creek, the Mill River, the Cold River, East Creek, and Furnace Brook. These are the main waterways that Route 7 goes through, and hence what my grandfather needed to build bridges. If these waterways weren't around here, we wouldn't need all these covered bridges. And I think a lot of us learned a lot about our waterways when Irene hit recently, and we learned a lot about how important these bridges are to our lives that we don't really, I mean, I think we take for granted because we drive over many just going from Rutland down to Manchester. You cross quite a few bridges. Some you don't even know. Some just look like the road. Uh, right now, for, my, for Nick Powers, there's one, two, three, four covered bridges still in existence that you could visit today that he built. Um, I'm going to talk about the 20 covered bridges in this area that he built, but these are the four. One is the Brown Bridge in Shrewsbury. This bridge, when you go just before that water tower, there's a water tower in North Rutland. You take the road here, uh, is North Chittenden Road maybe? And you'll see, um, right when you go over the, a bridge, you'll see a shed next to it. That's a covered bridge. It used to be called the twin bridges. There were two. So that's why I have two little. One's gone. One's disappeared. But they did save one of the bridges. And when you drive over that little bridge, you'll see it on the side of the road. It's used for, uh, I think, the, the uh, town puts uh, construction flags in there now and cones. And then there's two in, uh, up there in Proctor, one over uh, Furnace Brook, which is called the uh, Cooley, and one over the mill, or the Otter Creek, which is called Gora. So you can visit those two right now. And of course, the Brown Bridge in Shrewsbury was uh, renovated, recently restored. And then you can see one just on the side of the road that he built. So there's four currently that he built, and this star is where we are right now. So it kind of lays out what his um, footprint was in this area of covered bridges. When I was doing my research and I read there was 20 bridges he built, I wanted to find them. That was my number one um, goal, was to see if I could find the 20 bridges that Nick Powers built. Um, people are, he's kind of goes by two names. Some call him Nichols, which is what some of the historians have been now using. So a lot of my family members still use Nicholas, um, which is in some of his writings, it's on Nicholas. So it's a kind of a debate that we have. And Nichols was a family name. Nichols. Is Mother or grandmother was a Nichols, was her last name. Correct. Correct. So we have, we still, and we have writings where they would, maybe his nickname was Nicholas. I'm not sure. So I'm Nicholas, but my first name's Alf. I go by uh, Nick because my father's Alf and my grandfather's Alf, and I was done being the third Alf. <laughs> I stuck to my middle name, Nick. And life's a lot easier now that I'm Nick. So, um, 
Why the bridge? Well, in this area, our local waters, we need bridges. The Otter Creek, the Mill River, the Cold River, the East Creek, uh, Furnace Brook, Kenny Brook. We go over quite a few waterways. Um, covering the bridge was important to protect the wood. Uh, we didn't have, a, there wasn't a lot of uh, modern steel and iron at the time, so they used wood and they needed to protect it from the elements. There were about 14,000 in the U.S. at one point. Starting in the early 1800s, they started building covered bridges. Um, and there were 700 in Vermont at one point. Now we have 100. It's a lot. There's a hundred covered bridges. Bless you. And, um, oh, and I apologize. Uh, 14 of the 24 in Rutland County were Nick Powers. There were other bridges elsewhere that I'll talk about, and I think is where the 20 came to. But um, 14 of the 24 were from Nick, and there are still some that he had a little bit to do with, but it wasn't really his primary creation. So we didn't use those. Um, and there are still four, as I talked about, that you can visit today that still exist. Is Kingsley part of his? No. No. But I heard that he might have had some connection with it, but it wasn't his bridge. Um, Yes. Timothy K. Horton, and the Hortons lived in Clarendon Flats. Yes. So, yeah. Right across the road. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, uh, it was Powers property. Yes. And I'm biased, as you're going to probably find out. <clears throat> I think he's the best, best built bridge builder, but I, um, I'm just in awe of what 27% um, of covered bridges are existing in Pennsylvania, 17% Ohio, 13 Indiana, 11 Vermont, 6 New Hampshire, and 6 Oregon. So that kind of gives you kind of where people go to look for covered bridges. And, but Vermont's one of the states that folks do come to to admire our covered bridges and, and the architecture. Um, a bridge in its simplest form is to traverse across an open section, and if there is no support, this wood will kind of bow down and collapse. So you create trusses. So when the force comes into that center section, you're not delivering the force to the edges, to the, the you know the, the banks. Uh, this is called a king truss. It's a very simple truss. And this is an example of a king truss. Um, the weight comes down to the center, the weakest point, but it's diverted to the edges. That's where that force gets forced out to. Um, lots of uh, timbers involved when you make trusses like this. You know, there's a lot of... Um, uh, some of this are hands sewn, you know, timbers and logs that do take time. Queen post is another form of truss, maybe to go over a longer span. You have uh, various kind of connections of trusses. That's, a, that's an example of one. You can see the, the, the timbers, the, the, the large, heavy um, pieces of wood. Then there's, you can get into some pretty complex trusses, some arch trusses, and that's an example. Again, these are not the, my grandfather's, but these are examples of the types of designs of covered bridges. This was what um, my grandfather built. What he was famous for was utilizing uh, the town, the, the lattice truss design. Um, this was created by Ithiel Town, uh, I believe is the name of the creator. And they used planks, many planks, with um, almost like pegs. And this design was less expensive. It was a little bit more efficient. It didn't take these large, 
expensive timbers. You could use kind of thin, thinner pieces of wood. So when you go over the Kingsley Bridge, you'll see they all, that's also a lattice truss. And this um, was a bridge design that Nick Powers utilized, and it became a pretty um, popular design. This is also a cutout of what, um, this actually is a cutout of the Brown Bridge in Shrewsbury, how these are called um, cords, and it would kind of connect these lattice pieces together. And when you drive through a, a lattice bridge, you'll see these pegs, some call them tree nails. They're just big wooden pegs that they might have used um, Oh gosh, an evergreen uh, variety. Oh, we're on a blank now. Uh, spruce? Y yes, spruce. The old timers would say a stick of spruce is as strong as a stick of iron. So they use spruce, a lot of spruce wood. It'll tell you, James, I bet it will, especially the old, the old stuff. Um, this is another example of just a complex, I just found this to be an interesting, you just see that this is a lot of truss design with uh, those timbers versus the, the lattice design. Uh, so Nick, Nick was born in 1817 in Pittsburgh and he died in Clarendon in 1897. Uh, so what's that, eight, 80 years old? And almost 80. He, he um, has two national landmarks. Uh, as for many of you buffs of history, you know there are national historic places and then there are what are called national landmarks. National landmarks are pretty prized um, architect or, or pieces of history that need to be protected to protect the history of the United States, a piece of the United States versus historic place, which might be important for the time, this tends to have importance in a historical, um, kind of almost like it, it has to be continued, it needs to be protected. Um, Nick was located, uh, ed educated locally, self-taught, self-reliant, didn't go to a fancy school. It, his gift was uh, mechanical, he said he obtained this from one of his family members, Gideon Cooley, who you'll find, probably came down the Otter Creek a long time ago when a lot of us settled this area. Um, so the family tree goes way back to Gideon Cooley, one of the first settlers to come down the Otter Creek, 1737, um, settled Pittsburgh. He had a daughter, Elizabeth Cooley, who marries the Powers. The Powers is where my family came. My, mom, my dad's mother is Powers. Powers are down on the creek, uh, the Clarendon Flats, um, and Nick, Nick was the Powers. And then they had a son, Richard Powers, who had a son, Nick Powers, Nick Montgomery, my grandfather, great, great, married a fish. Um, Russ Powers was their son, who then had a son named Gratz Powers, who then had my grandmother, Grace Powers, who had who uh, married my grandfather. That's where this this name took over the Powers. So the Strommels and the, this Norwegian sea captain was uh, taking a, uh, one of his ships into port in Boston and met this gal from Clarendon who was visiting Boston and love at first sight. And he decided to move up to Clarendon. And he married the Powers and carried on the Strummel's name, and that's my dad, and my, his two sisters. So that, that's where I came from. Nick and my brother are from Elf and my mother. So he is my great-great. So grandmother, great, 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 great. I didn't know this. I learned all this. This was pretty exciting for me. Um, so, my goal was to find his bridges of Rutland County. So I used resources, local folks, books, and his first bridge was the Pittsburgh Mills Bridge. When you go down Route 7, north of Rutland, 
And you go and you start entering Pittsburgh. You come down Route 7 and it comes down and you see the gas station and you'll see a little shopping area called, the, I think, Pittsburgh Mill Shopping. That bridge was this bridge. It was a covered bridge. It actually was kind of interesting. It had a little lot on the side. Um, he was 19 years old. And when he first put a bid in, the town folk kind of laughed a little. Oh, this young kid thinks he's going to build our bridge. And his father put up the money and said, if he ruins any of your precious timber, I'll cover it. So they then accepted his bid because he had a, almost like a um, co-signer to, to kind of vouch for him. And when this bridge was removed in 31, as a lot of our covered bridges due to modern road widening, um, they had to figure a way to get a steamroller across it because that was a lot heavier than what the sign said for the weight limit. And they couldn't figure it out, so they just put almost like a brick on the gas pedal. This is a story I heard, and, and straightened it and just floored it, and it didn't even move the bridge, it just went right across it. <laughs> so these bridges were pretty sturdy, even at the end. The second bridge um, was over the Otter Creek in Pittsburgh. I, I don't know where this bridge was. I've looked for it. It was um, a, a destroyed in arson, also a second cause of some of the bridge um, loss was either loss of, due to modernization of roads or people would mess around with the bridges. The third bridge is still in existence. This is the Gorham Bridge, and it's, um, it's in Pittsburgh. I don't know why it's in Proctor. And it, that one's over the Otter Creek. And um, this one has been uh, you know, restored. It's a beautiful bridge if you ever get out up there in Pittsburgh and see it. This bridge, I believe, was in Clarendon or Shrewsbury. It, it was called the Old Bay Parker Bridge. Again, it was over the Cold River, which is just right out here. Um, it, I guess there was a lady who owned the land, and she would have a toll. I don't know if anyone's heard that. We had a toll bridge. She would ask for a, a payment. It's entirely the Cold River Road. Yes, that's where it was. You're right next to the Hotel line. Down there. Just, down down from, just, right to just down from the Christmas tree barn there. Okay, that's where that was. Okay. On uh, Cold River, as you're going up towards the hospital. Yeah. So that's, is that clear? That's clear. Yeah. yeah. You're still in Clarence until just a little bit after you cross the bridge. Okay. Go around the town. Kind of where that uh, mining facility where they do. Yeah. Uh, okay. Is that what it is? Uh, this was a bridge in Rutland, um, Route 7. So when you see Brilliant's Jeep on the left as you go out of Rutland, this there's a bridge you will go over, and that's where this bridge was. Um, the Lester Bridge, um, just a mile north of Rutland. Again, road winding. This bridge is still in existence. It's one of the smallest bridges. Um, oh, I should have had the notes on it. That's Cooley Bridge. Yes. Just up from the Gorm Bridge. Yes. I think it's uh, 65 or 70 feet, 65 feet. Mm -hmm. So it gives you an idea. So if that's the smallest bridge, ten, the averages tend to be 85, 95 for the average size. Uh, this was, there's still one of these in existence. It's a shed, and it's on that road, I said, as you go towards that water tower on the right. There, um, I guess he built one bridge, and then the creek shifted. So then he convinced the town, well, why don't I build your second bridge? <laughs> so he got paid twice. Um, and this was destroyed in the flood of 47, which I believe this bridge also, oh no, this was removed in 31. So th this would have been destroyed in the flood of 47 if it was still in existence. Because the flood of 47 was, uh, I believe there was an issue with the, um, 
the Chittenden Dam. No. East of the Oh, it was a pond. pond. And then it came down it a lot of it. It didn't. It didn't really. Right. So, but it was that East Creek, all those bridges. I think there was one by the Country Club maybe got yeah. hurt. That bridge got hurt. Um, and then I think the bridge on McKinley Avenue was also hurt. The McKinley Avenue where Twitter, Mr. Twitter's is with that purple fence. Um, I'm guessing this one was down here near Route 7. It's the old. Or is this seven. one on Middle Road? No, that would be the old Route 7. You know, the, north. The, where the, the bridge said to be north. Okay. Yeah. Where Nissan dealer is, you're saying. Yeah. That which is closed now. Yeah, there's no bridge there at all. No, it's gonna happen. It, it was a steel steel bridge. It was replaced by a right. steel bridge. Right. And took that down. Would have been, you know, this was lost in twenty seven and then a steel bridge got built and that one got ripped down too. Yes. So that's a cold river. Yes. Over a cold river. <clears throat> so really, I mean, based on my research, the creek, the mill river. Cold River and East Creek were some major, in a lot of ways, that we have to cross to go through Rutland. Um, this one also is in Clarendon. I'm not sure. I'm wondering if this was, so this is over Mill River. Was it one of the bridges by the gorge, maybe, where they swim? Probably. Because I don't know of any bridges above that. You know, in the Sharp Gorge, I mean, they, they had uh, um, they had mills up there, right? Mill River, but it's, it's hard, hard to visualize Route Seven. I know, I know. I can assume this bridge was kind of on the flatter areas, kind of where Route Seven is. I mean, the next bridge is up in Cuttingford, right? All right, because you got to go through that. This is McKinley Ave. This is the bridge that was by Mr. Twitter's, which I think also was destroyed in flood of 47. And you do see, you do cross that bridge. That's where the state police or where you go to DMV. That's a bridge. That looks like right. it's almost one-way traffic. <laughs> it looks so small. It must have been two-way traffic. I don't know. I mean, even the Kingsley Bridge, you know, you always have to wait for someone. There's so much. To me, I mean, it just seems like there's so much fantasy and um, stories behind cover bridges. And there wasn't as much traffic. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> to go from daylight to darkness to daylight. There's something weird about that transition when you travel a cover bridge. Um, this one is uh, at the end of the door drive, the creek road, again over the other creek. Um, based on what I found is that Nick became, um, was ill, and so his son, age 17, finished the bridge for him. The photo was taken from uh, the hill across from that bridge, Fern Cottage, oh, really? my grandfather was caretaker for 49 years. A oh, Fern Dratton's on it. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. I, that's a pretty massive stand right there. Crossing that creek. Now there was one um, south of there too, from where I read that. Where the UPS is on Cross Street? Yes. It yes. Was a little out of creek. That was Billings Street. That one? Yes. Yes. It was burnt Halloween 1949. Uh, oh, you're right. The you're right. And that was I think the Fortin Bridge. Hours before I was born. The Billings Bridge. Which I, I have a picture of it in my office. You're it, telling us it wasn't you. <laughs> it wasn't you. Yeah. It was burned down by arson. The <laughs> now and, and I wrote stories that because that bridge is at the end of Park Street, which is kind right. of a lonely area, and there was a lot of mischief that occurred at the end of Park Street. I hear they're still there. If you don't want to go back. <laughs> no, I know. In that church in the background, the St. Peter's Church. Yeah. Okay. okay. MSJ St. Peter's Field is directly straight upstream where you see the river going. Ah, okay. And it used to be a trestle across. Yes. It used to come across Forest Street where I live mm -hmm. and turn and go through Calvary Cemetery and down and then 
across. Sorry. Well, it wasn't across. Right there, where that there. white line is, across there, and then, then across East Creek. Okay, okay. But then the south is there. There is the truss there. Yes. You can see the truss on there. Right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, neat. And well, that's down. over the road. Right. Yeah. They took down the wall. Can you a truss on them? That's not right. It's oh, I got it. The some of that some of that structure had still been there when I was a kid, it may still be there now. Well it was still there until they <coughs> the renovation put the new bridges in and they took a lot of that off. Right. And the new bridges moved over one side or the other than this bridge. The current one. Oh wow. Yeah, the Billings Bridge, um, if you go on the new highway towards Castleton, it crosses the creek. You know, and if you ever go down the creek road, you can actually, if you go out to the by creek, you can see where the, the stone embankments are. You can see the you can see this up in Drive. You can. Drive. You can. Okay. Just north of the bypass. Okay. You can see the abutments. You can. Okay. From the Wire Street side, we used to ride a bicycle right up to the abutment, and if we went over, <laughs> we'd be in the water. Oh, no, really? <laughs> wow. Uh, this one was the bridge over that's down in Wallingford, where you know down by uh, on Route 140 when you cross the creek. This one was um, removed in '49. I think this is a kind of an iron bridge now. Yeah. Green truss bridge. Truss bridge. Truss. Yeah. Um, another so bridge was reportedly haunted by the ghost of a man who committed suicide. Yeah. That was a story I also read a lot about, you know, suicides or murders in these covered bridges. Just kind of eerie, you know, that, I don't know, they call them kissing bridges. Kissing, okay. So, no. <laughs> well, yeah, it could be death or work. Or yeah. I read stories of kids that would hide in, hide in the rafters, <laughs> watching the kissers that would go through. I don't remember that day. <laughs> They were not here remember those days. <laughs> uh, this is the Rutland Country Club. So this this was the Baxter Farm, and this is Grove Street. And so if you drive down and pass the Country Club, you'll see the guys hitting here on the 18th Green, hit over the and creek. And the 18th, 17th Green was right in there. And the 17th Green was just here. Yeah, and the 18th all the way up here. And you hit over, and that bridge is still there. And, uh, that was also the 47 flood that was kind of got whacked, like those other bridges. And um, I've hit many balls over on this side, which is now just trees. <laughs> CJ knows that side over oh, there. Yeah. And the uh, second shot, I put them into the parking lot. You can hear them, bo 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 between the cars. I don't know if you played recently, but now they put a brand new sand trap up here on the right. Uh -huh. It's just interesting to see these you can see the pieces of the land. That never changes. But how we use it definitely changes. So how far upstream is Patches Dam? Patches Dam all the way down to the entrance is uh, where they stocked the trout recently. Oh, OK, yes. I see a lot of fishermen down there. And that's the reason. And this is his last bridge, 1880. And this is, um, I believe, one of the most famous local bridges is his Brown Bridge in Shrewsbury. Um, this is a national landmark now. The United States government, um, the Department of the Interior, decided to name this as a um, national landmark. There's not many cover bridges that are national landmarks. Um, I think there was, I think there's only maybe one or two cover bridges. And they, they deem this as a perfect example of a, of a, a, lat, of a lattice design. And the way it's in the location, down in a hollow, on a giant boulder, it just it has a, 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 a fantasy view of it, of a storybook kind of picture. And they deem this to be of high importance to save and protect for all of our, as long as they can, as long as the U.S. is here. And it, it's, uh, it's on a back road. Yes. And, uh, so it isn't going to have pressure to right. be upgraded in, in that sense. 
correct. And, uh, so it, it almost like probably went into the, like a snapshot in time. Yeah. It will always be there. And they close out over the winter. Oh, they do. Yeah, not. Okay. Last fall, not it's, anymore. Not anymore. Is that right? It's over all year. They oh, let you go through the whole year. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't know that at your own risk or it's the power. Oh, it's maintained all the way through. Um, again, as a kid growing up, I mean, I I pay out my neighbors and play ball, and I I just would have to see pictures of covered bridges on my parents' walls, but I didn't understand the importance of some of these bridges in the area. Um, so, any, I mean. I don't know if there's any questions. I mean, I found these. Are, that's the 14th. I found his bridges going through. Some of them I don't know where exactly they are. Some of them I can tell. Um, but this bridge was deemed a, a national historic landmark recently uh, in 2014. So if you go down there, you'll see some pretty pretty nice plaques uh, detailing the history of this bridge. Senator Jeffords. Yes, and, and, land. and it's connected to his yes. Yes. and uh, who knows, that might have had some. I bet it did. I bet it did. He has an important part of the state, too. Um, so again, what we talked about in the last trust, it, did, it eliminated the need for that wood joinery, that complex um, joining. There's um, about 110 lattice trusses in the U.S. now. And this one had an unusual slate roof, and that abutment is a big boulder, which was unusual. It, does, it did use local stone and local lumber when it was built. And that rural said that, that aesthetic integrity that might stay for a long time probably went into the decision making. Um, this is, I believe this is one of yeah, Ithiel Town's actual designs in 1820, when he was patenting his design, the lattice truss, the town truss. Um, this is a side cutout. When this bridge went into becoming a landmark, it went through some extreme understudy. You know, many architects had to go through the bridge and look at it and break it apart before they said it was a national landmark. So this I got right from the, a government's website, um, I think the Department of the Interior. This, these are examples of joinery, you know, examples of some of the complex designs to join big pieces of wood, which didn't need to be done with lattice. Um, this this is again another cutout showing these cords. I guess they sway. They can sway almost, and so move, and it just it gives the bridge integrity. Um, these were pictures from the Rutland Daily Herald, 1879. Maybe roofing slate that was used. Maybe spruce that was used. Just different. Uh, examples that I found. Um, so then, as I learned more about my grandfather, I learned he did things outside of Vermont, too. Um, this was his second, well, his first national landmark. This bridge was in Blenheim, New York, and it was, at the time, the longest single-span wooden bridge in the world. It was in the Guinness Book of World Records. And um, 232 feet. It was not a lattice truss. He had to use timbers, and he, I believe he used an arch when he built this. Um, I have a quick article because we were Bob and I were talking about that they had to rebuild this bridge. So this bridge was destroyed in Irene. This was wiped out, and we did go. My family went to one of the. Oh, I think it was, I, I can't remember it. It was one of the anniversaries of the bridge. I was just a little kid. And the town, this was their centerpiece. This bridge was so important to the town of Glenham. They would gather there during different events. And even though this bridge was no longer used, 
there was a lot of road that went around it. This was still their bridge. This was so when Irene came and destroyed it, it was heartbreaking. So the town, in our an article in 2019, says the Blenheim Covered Bridge stands once again. This is from the Albany Times Union. It says after years of efforts to secure funding, it was successful towards reconstructing the historical structure of the small Schoharie County town. Hundreds gathered in Blenheim to commemorate the new bridge. The bridge was first constructed in 1855 at a cost of $6,000 by Vermonter Nicholas Montgomery Powers. It was the longest single span, so no supports under it, bridge in the world. Uh, their hearts were broken. And so the cost for reconstruction was seven million dollars. Seventy-five percent was covered by FEMA, and the rest um, by the state, with no local property tax money used. How did they reconstruct this through FEMA? Well, after years of back and forth, because um, they won't secure funding for historical value, but. They did restore funding, they argue, for community gathering. And it was that debate that allowed the funding to be put in place for this bridge. And it really is, I, I just remember as a kid, I wanted to gather around and talk to them. I didn't even know, oh, you're Nick Powers, great, great, grandson. I don't know who that is. <laughs> um, but if you ever drive out there, you'll see it. It's, it's built again. It stands. This was a bridge she built. This was a 3,269-foot bridge um, over the Susquehanna River in Maryland. Uh, a story that I read was he was doing some farming in Clarendon, and the folks down in Maryland, they were having trouble f finishing this bridge. The design guess, could it sustain certain storms, or certain storms that could come by and it would hurt and destroy some of the bridge. So they came up and looked for this engineer named Nick Powers, they heard about, and they wanted to see if he could help them with some of their experts. And he said, well, I'm going to have lunch, let me get back to you. And when he returned an hour later, he had it drawn on a piece of wood the design he recommended. And they were pretty much in shock because he could just see it. He came up with it quickly. Would it still look with a piece of wood? I wish. <laughs> no. <laughs> I did find a piece of linen in the old brick house that had that one design of his, which was special. And this Vermont uh, Division, the historic, the, the uh, Vermont Division for Historic Preservation has it now. My dad's like, you only have it for a little bit. You know that. I'm like, okay. Um, so besides bridges, he did uh, the, cheese, the cheese factory on the mill road. Um, oh, no. Uh, let me see. Oh, no. We're it here. is. We're here. He built this. The old steeple, the old brick church. Um, he moved a pretty heavy belfry in Rutland County Courthouse to the front of the building. Uh, roundhouse for the railroad. First Derrick got raised a block of marble from West Rutland, which as you know is a big marble section. Built, built barn, barns, he was a barn builder. And one of his famous was the, um, which is still standing, the grist mill down um, just down the road. <laughs> and, and you can see the Kingsley Bridge in the distance. But this was the grist mill. And it was uh, the only mill he designed and built. And as folks can tell you in this area, it's still standing. And it fought through Irene and it held strong. I mean, the playing there as a kid and the woodworking here is phenomenal. Well, the, the owner is right behind you. This, this gentleman owns it all the way back there. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And he kept it. We used to swim there too when we brought up the Clarendon. That was called the dam. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I see. 
you will pick up on the dam, and just beyond the bridge where the clay's at, yes. then there's a middle gorge, center gorge, and then the lower gorge with bridges. And so they had uh, like railroad piers almost to build a dam? Was it wood and straw? We just found the dam. I don't know. I don't know see any remnants of it, but I do remember going in there and climbing up to the top. It was scary. Really? No, no, no. It's all open. I believe there was a dam there that was lost in the 1927 flood. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? And, and Ron, I'm sorry, that's Ron Evans. Who's, Thank you. Yeah, yeah it, it was a 27 flood. It took a wood crib dam. It had actually reached pretty much its maximum lifespan anyway yeah. by, by 1927. And how old would that be? Uh, well, 45 to 50 years would be the expected lifespan. It was 1880 that it was constructed, 81. Yes. And it was constructed, so it was getting close. And um, however, they continued operating the, the mill until 34, 35. Okay, don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Legend has it that they operated the mill by powering it with a flywheel off a John Deere tractor that they brought into the, through the double doors. Wow, oh, that's cool. Until Chester Kingsley passed away. That wow. Was, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I thank uh, Ron, and Linda from the Gristmill, and my parents, and my, my, my aunts, yeah. my two aunts, and the Ron Historical Society was important when I first started doing my research. Um, but I'm very grateful to be sharing this with you all and learning a little bit about this area where, where I grew up. So thank you very much. Oh,